The Australian Disorders of the Corpus Callosum Support Group is a group of families that have um, either children or adults in their families with um, a dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. This is the major connection between the two brain hemispheres. And it's associated with many, many different uh, uh, congenital syndromes where the person might have um, corpus callosum disorder and something else, but it can also be found in isolation. And uh, this group of families provide a really important support network for people with these disorders. So disorders of the corpus callosum come in in different forms. So there's something called complete agenesis of the corpus callosum and that's usually uh, when there's no fibres that cross between the two hemispheres of the brain um, that connect, connect the two regions. There's also other confusing terms called partial agenesis of the corpus callosum and that is when some of the fibres cross the midline so it's a, a very small corpus callosum. And then another group is um, hyperplastic um, corpus callosum but that just means a thin corpus callosum. And so they, these are all different terms that uh, come under the banner of dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum actually begins to form during um, in utero development. So um, just at the in the first end of the first trimester, so around 12, 12 weeks of gestation, the corpus callosum starts to form and you have a fully formed corpus callosum by about 20 to 22 weeks of gestation. So that means that any disorders of the corpus callosum occur before birth normally. There are some environmental um, factors that can impact the development of the corpus callosum, um, but we don't know very much about these. One we know that is associated with um, uh, disorders of the corpus callosum is fetal alcohol syndrome. But apart from that, there's not a lot of research that's been done that links environmental factors with corpus callosum disorders. Therefore, many of these, or all, the, all of the rest, are genetic disorders. It's incredibly important that we have research into the causes of corpus callosum um, malformation, so dysgenesis of the corpus callosum. It's also crucially important that we look, we have research that follows people over time, the longitudinal studies, where we can link together um, what is the outcome for people with corpus callosum disorders? How, how does um, a malformation of the corpus callosum affect the person during their whole lifetime, not just as children, but also as adults and in, in um, people as they age? And at the moment, there's very little understanding of um, these aspects of life, living with a corpus callosum disorder. And so we really need research in this area, both to look at the causes, to try and develop better treatments and understand why corpus callosum malformations occur, but also to link that with what are the outcomes for people that have corpus callosum disorders. Disorders of the corpus callosum are diagnosed by um, either ultrasound prior to birth or by MRI. And that might be as a fetal MRI prior to birth or after birth. So it's only been since we've had these technologies that disorders of the corpus callosum have really been able to be identified at all. Now, there is another um, group of subjects that were studied um, a couple of decades ago by um, a man called Roger Sperry, who won a Nobel Prize for this work. And uh, he studied people who'd had their corpus callosum cut, surgically cut, because they had very, very severe epilepsy. And what he found by studying these people, the, the corpus callosum was cut so that um, it would prevent the seizures these people were having, which were very severe and um, very frequent throughout the day. The seizures would travel from one side of the brain to the other via the corpus callosum. So if that was surgically cut, it was a way of controlling the epilepsy before we had um, good drugs to control the seizures. Now these people actually have a very different outcome 
to people who are born without a corpus callosum. So we really need to understand what's different if you have um, lived your life with a corpus callosum and then you have a corpus callosum injury or um, in this case a surgical cut. How is that different in terms of the outcome for the person than if you're born without a corpus callosum and you live your life without a corpus callosum and how the brain adapts to, to that situation?